Thank you. You may be seated. Well, Sunday is my day for exercise. <laughs> Let's take our Bibles and turn to the book of Acts. Tonight we're in Acts chapter 19. We're looking at verses 8 through 10. Hard hearts and hanging on. Acts chapter 19, verses 8 through 10. Now you recall that last week we actually covered the second part of Mighty in the Scriptures and then also covered Did You Get the Holy Ghost Yet? So we looked at the last part of Acts chapter 18, verses 24 through 28, and then we also looked at Acts chapter 19, verses 1 through 7. So very, very quickly I'm hoping to move through a review of that because it is foundational for what we are looking at tonight, which is hard hearts and hanging on. Let's join in prayer. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you once again for the privilege of studying your word. We pray that you will teach us to be men and women who are mighty in the scriptures. That is where we get our strength from. That is where we are able to continue hanging on in spite of opposition, as we'll be seeing tonight. Help us to be men and women who, when we are tempted to get discouraged, go back to what your word has to say. And then give us the strength and the courage to keep moving forward by the grace of God, in the power of the Spirit of God, and for the glory of Christ. Father, we pray for your blessings upon our study tonight, for we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. You recall that while we were looking at Mighty in the Scriptures, and we'll not review part one, but we will review a little bit out of part two, we saw that there was a certain Jew named Apollos born at Alexandria, an eloquent man and mighty in the Scriptures, and that he came to Ephesus. That's back in verse 24. And we saw that the Word of God, being mighty in the Scriptures, has some very powerful implications. The first and most obvious of these is salvation that from a child thou hast known the holy scriptures, which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. That is where our birth comes from, is from the hearing of the word of God. Faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. And Peter talks about it in 1 Peter 1.23, being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible by the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. To be mighty in the scriptures, you first have to be saved. Uh, just because you have a, a great head knowledge about the Bible, and there have been some unsaved people in history who do that, they are not mighty in the scriptures. Being mighty in the scriptures also provides protection. Every word of God is pure. He is a shield unto them that put their trust in him. Being mighty in the scriptures guarantees provision. Jesus answered him, saying, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word of God. Being mighty in the scriptures assumes spiritual growth. Now the parable is this, the seed is the word of God. Being mighty in the scriptures requires obedience and a visible response to the scriptures. He answered and said unto them, My mother and brethren are these which hear the word of God and do it. But he said, Yea, rather, blessed are they that hear the word of God and keep it. Being mighty in the scriptures requires obedience and a visible response to Scripture. Being mighty in the Scripture guarantees power over evil. Acts 19.20, so mightily grew the word of God and prevailed. We're going to see that very, very shortly after this text that we're looking at tonight, just a couple of weeks away. Paul was willing to hang on, and as a result of being willing to hang on, even in spite of opposition, there came a great revival, and the word of God prevailed. Being mighty in the scripture implies both saving faith and sanctifying faith. So then faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Being mighty in the scriptures guarantees spiritual victory in the warfare against the devil. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. That's the spiritual warfare passage out of Ephesians chapter 6. Being mighty in the scriptures gives internal freedom even when we are physically imprisoned wherein I suffer trouble as an evildoer, even unto bonds, but the word of God is not bound. Being mighty in the scriptures helps fulfill family responsibility because others are watching. And this is written to women especially, but it also applies to men. 
to be discreet, chaste, keepers at home, good, obedient to their own husbands, that the word of God be not blasphemed. Being mighty in the scriptures helps fulfill that family responsibility because others are watching. Being mighty in the scripture gives a reality check and a touchstone for our own spiritual condition. For the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any, any two-edged sword, piercing even through the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and of the joints and marrow and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. It's a touchstone for our spiritual condition. Being mighty in the scriptures gives a final word on scientific and historical matters. Second Peter 3, 5, for this they willingly are ignorant of that by the word of God, the heavens were of old and the earth standing out of the water and in the water. Both creation and the flood are mentioned there in that verse. Being mighty in the scriptures helps keep you from being defiled. Blessed are the undefiled that walk in the law of the Lord. Blessed are they that keep his testimonies, that seek him with the whole heart. They that also that do no iniquity, they walk in his ways. Thou hast commanded us to keep thy precepts diligently. Oh, that my ways were directed to keep thy statutes. A lot of verses in Psalm 119 that deal with that. Being mighty in the scripture keeps you from shame. Then shall I not be ashamed when I have respect unto all thy testimonies. Being mighty in the scriptures causes the believer to praise God. I will praise thee with uprightness of heart when I shall have learned thy righteous judgments. I will keep thy statutes. O oh, forsake me not utterly. Being mighty in the scripture cleanses us and keeps us from sin. Wherewithal shall a young man cleanse his way by taking heed thereunto according to thy word. With my whole heart have I sought thee. O oh, let me not wander from thy commandments. Thy word have I hid in mine heart that I might not sin against thee. Being mighty in the scriptures gives us light and direction for daily living. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Of course, we could say a whole lot more out of Psalm 119 alone. But being mighty in the scriptures, which is what we covered last uh, week in the first half of the message, has a lot more to it than merely knowing Bible verses and being a powerful preacher. It means that you are able to communicate the scriptures because the scriptures have transformed your life. That means that a woman who is not biblically permitted to be a preacher can also be mighty in the scriptures. And then the second part of the message last week was, did you get the Holy Ghost yet? And that was the last part of uh, that Acts 19 passage that we studied. Paul comes across these uh, believers, there are 12 of them. He's found certain disciples and he says, uh, did you receive the Holy Ghost since you believe? And they said unto him, we've not so much as heard whether there be any Holy Ghost. And he said unto them, unto what then were you baptized? And they said unto John's baptism. Then said Paul, John verily baptized with the baptism of repentance, saying unto the people that they should believe on him, which should come after him, that is, on Christ Jesus. When they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. And when Paul had laid his hands upon them, the Holy Ghost came on them, and they spake with tongues and prophesied, and all the men were about twelve. Very briefly, we learned several principles about the work of God through his chosen servants in this passage. Verse 1, we learned that God places his servants in strategic locations at different periods in their lives and often causes different choice servants to go to the same place because they have different gifts that are needed by the people in that place. And we contrasted all the people that have been there in Ephesus and how Paul is there at this point. We're going to find that there's going to be some believers in Ephesus and some hardness of heart tonight. But because Paul stuck it out, there comes a great revival. The second thing that we learned out of that passage was that verse introduced us to the very last new group of believers to be brought into the body of Christ. These were Old Testament believers who were disciples of John the Baptist. In verse 2, we saw the key verse was a very serious verse for charismatic misinterpretation. The charismatics and Pentecostals use that verse to teach a second blessing after salvation, and they claim that you can trust Christ and be saved but not yet have the Holy Spirit and perhaps not for many years, or maybe even not during your entire lifetime. And we saw that that was wrong for several reasons. First, in this dispensation, you cannot be saved without having the Holy Spirit. Receiving the 31 automatic works of the Holy Spirit at the moment of salvation is part of the package of New Testament salvation, including the permanently indwelling Holy Spirit of God. Romans 8 and 9 tells us that. But you are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, if so be that the Spirit of God dwell in you. Now, if any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he is none of his. So if you say, well, yeah, I, I trusted Christ and I got saved, but I don't have the Holy Spirit. Paul says here, if any man has not the Spirit of Christ, 
He is none of his. And that's in the context of the Spirit of God dwelling in you. In the Old Testament, we saw that the Holy Spirit came upon people and sometimes came into people for power so that they would have the Holy Spirit for a time, but then the Holy Spirit would leave them. He came on them for power, but he could also be withdrawn. And that's why David prays in Psalm 51, verse 10 and 11, Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from thy presence, and take not thy Holy Spirit from me. David understood, recognized the possibility of God withdrawing his spirit. That had happened to King Saul. The Holy Spirit had come upon King Saul, and we see that over in 1 Samuel. But then God withdrew his Holy Spirit from King Saul, removed him from the throne, and put David in his place. And we'll be looking at some of those passages tonight. We know the Holy Spirit entered into people in the Old Testament because the New Testament says so. Peter, speaking of looking forward to Christ whom we have not seen, receiving the end of your faith, even the salvation of your souls, this is 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 10 now, of which salvation the prophets have inquired and searched diligently, who prophesied of the grace that should come unto you, verse 11, our key verse, proves that the Holy Spirit did come inside of people in the Old Testament, not merely upon them, searching what or what manner of time the Spirit of Christ, which was in them did signify when it testified beforehand the sufferings of Christ and the glory that should be revealed. The second phrase that we looked at there in some detail last week was that phrase, since you believed. And we saw that that does not indicate a time sequence in the Greek. In other words, one event followed by a space of time followed by a second event, which is what the charismatics teach. They teach you can get saved, then you go for long periods and perhaps all the way to your death before you receive the second event, which is the work of the Holy Spirit coming into you. Have you received the Holy Spirit since you believed? Literally translated, we saw that is, having believed, have you received the Holy Ghost? In other words, Paul was trying to determine what their spiritual state was because he knew the reception of the Holy Ghost, ever since Acts chapter 2, was a guaranteed automatic result of trusting in the finished work of Christ. We'll look at a similar construction over in Ephesians chapter 1. We'll not go over that again tonight. John not only taught the coming of Christ, remember these were, they'd been baptized unto the baptism of John. These were disciples of John. And John had taught not only the coming of Christ, but John also taught the coming of the Holy Spirit. These people knew that, but they did not know that Jesus had come, died, been buried, risen, ascended, and had already sent the Holy Spirit. They were in the position of Old Testament states still waiting for the coming of the Messiah. And this is the last group to be brought into the body of Christ here in Acts chapter 19. John prophesied the coming of the Holy Spirit. Matthew chapter 3, verse 11. I indeed baptize you with water unto repentance, but he that cometh after me is mightier than I, and that's, of course, the prophecy of the Messiah, whose shoes I am not worthy to bear. Here's the quote about the baptism of the Holy Spirit. He shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire. So John's disciples knew that. They were disciples of John whose fan is in his hand, and he will thoroughly purge his floor and gather his wheat into the garner, but he will burn up the chaff of unquenchable fire. And that's what brings us to tonight, verses 8 through 10, hard hearts and hanging on. And he went into the synagogue and spake boldly for the space of three months, disputing and persuading the things concerning the kingdom of God. And we might pause and mention that did not merely mean one hour with all the rest of the service included too on Saturday morning where sometimes the people showed up and sometimes they didn't and sort of hit and miss for them. He went into the synagogue and disputed. Paul was there every day. He was there for 90 days. He was not only there on the Sabbath day, he was reasoning with them, talking with them out of the Old Testament scriptures. These were long sessions that were going on at this point. The Apostle Paul wasn't giving little homilies that were 20 minutes in length and then sat down uh, while the choir sang another anthem. They sang a final hymn and they had a benediction. It's not the way that it worked. Paul went in and he was reasoning with them every day. But when divers were hardened and believed not, but spake evil of that way before the multitude, he departed from them and separated the disciples, disputing daily in the school of one Tyrannus. Very interesting. We find the Apostle Paul often stays in the same location when he gets run out of the synagogue and he goes very close by, like uh, he went right to the house next door when he was in Corinth and preached there and the ruler of the synagogue got converted and then later another ruler of the synagogue got converted. 
They could hear him preaching through the walls. He hung out right next door. Here we find him doing the same thing. He stays in town, and he begins to dispute in the school of one Tyrannus. Very interesting phrase there. Uh, John Lightfoot, who is a very, very famous scholar of the last century who did a great deal of research uh, on this, uh, tells us that there were many places where a synagogue was also associated with what we would call a divinity school, where there would be a rabbi who was training in the divinity school and who was teaching the Old Testament scriptures to his students so that they could also become rabbis. We don't know that for sure about Tyrannus, but that's a possibility. That Tyrannus was one of those in the synagogue who went with Paul while the others rejected, and he said, well, look, you can come over to my school. Come on in, and you can help train my divinity students. God opens unique doors when we do what he tells us to do. Paul didn't just say, well, enough of you guys. I'm not going to stay around here any longer, and left town. He stayed there because God had a special plan for what was going to go on in Ephesus. And it says, And this continued by the space of two years, so that all they which dwelt in Asia heard the word of the Lord Jesus, both Jews and Greeks. Now you recall a lot of things have gone on already here in the book of Acts. Ten chapters earlier, the Apostle Paul is converted on the road to Damascus, <clears throat> and at his conversion, he's told that God's going to send him not only to Jews, but he's also going to send him to some Gentiles. We find that Peter is, in Acts chapter 10, gets a revelation about that too, that the Gentiles are going to get brought into the body of Christ when Peter goes to the house of Cornelius. We find that God is moving in the book of Acts from that very exclusive group of Jewish men in Acts chapter 2 to those who are both men and women in Acts chapter 8 with the Samaritan revival, to one who is neither male nor female, and he's neither, not a Jew and not a Gentile. I mean, he's a converted from being a Gentile to being a Jew. That's Ethiopian eunuch. And then we move to the Gentiles who are 100% Gentiles and part of the persecuting nation in Acts chapter 10. In the midst of all that, Paul has gotten converted, and Paul has been made the apostle to the Gentiles. And so we find here that as he is preaching, he doesn't avoid Jews. He always goes to the synagogue first whenever there's the opportunity to do so. But he's also reaching out to the Gentiles, both Jews and Greeks, verse 10. Now, as we look at these three verses here, we, at least I as a pastor, see some things that uh, I have experienced. Every preacher, every evangelist, every pastor has had at some time to deal with people who hardened their hearts to the preaching of the Word of God. On Sunday mornings, we've been seeing the incredible hardness of Pharaoh's heart, and those of you who've been with us on Sunday morning know that is an incredibly hard heart after you see some of the details about the plagues that God sent on Egypt. Some of them were quite miserable plagues. And we saw this morning that God reached down and touched Pharaoh's heart. First time out of all the plagues that have gone on so far. God reached down and touched Pharaoh's heart and actually put some fear into Pharaoh's heart. And he went about in a pseudo repentance. We didn't get that far in the message this morning. Lord willing, we'll be talking about that next week. Where he says, I have sinned in my people. The Lord is righteous and we are wicked. But we find it wasn't genuine repentance. Because genuine repentance changes your life. It was only verbal assent to get the pain to go away. But I'm not going to preach next Sunday's morning message right now. But we see something there. We see the incredible hardness of Pharaoh's heart even after God gave him multiple opportunities to repent. And for 90 days, God was giving the people there the opportunity to repent. People responded both to Christ and the Apostle Paul with belief and also with hard hearts. So it should come as no surprise to us when they respond to our message with hard hearts and, in some cases, with very cruel rejection. That's, of course, what happened to our Lord Jesus Christ. So we need to learn, and I'm saying this as much to myself as to any of you, don't take it personally, although that's easy to do. It really is easy to do. You know, you preach your heart out, you teach as clearly as you can, and people harden their hearts. And sometimes it shows up just sort of as a yawn and 
Mm, that's interesting. When, in fact, it's not. Or with antagonism and bitterness and rejection. A pastor, a Bible teacher, an evangelist needs to recognize that they've not rejected you. They've rejected the word of God. But you know, there's some very serious consequences for rejecting the word of God spoken by his servants. If they speak the word of God faithfully and truly, there are serious consequences for rejecting the word of God. Now, it's really easy to take rejection personally. I know I've been there. Sometimes I've been there with you as a congregation. But let me just give you a couple of illustrations about this principle out of the life of Samuel. We're in 1 Samuel chapter 8 for just a few moments here, beginning in verse 4. Then all the elders of Israel gathered themselves together and came to Samuel unto Ramah. Now Samuel has been a judge of Israel for many years, but a faithful judge. He's the very last of the judges. He's the last one before we move into the monarchy. And these people, these elders of Israel, hey, this is the leaders. They said unto him, now this is a nasty thing to say. Behold, thou art old. <laughs> hey folks, you're going to get there someday too. It's not just the preacher who's getting old. Thou art old. And thy sons walk not in thy ways. Now, do you think that God could raise up somebody else if a leader's sons were not godly? The answer should be an obvious yes, and these people ought to have known it. Because who served in the tabernacle immediately prior to Samuel? It was Eli. And Eli had some rotten sons. They were named Hophni and Phinehas. And God, and it says they, they, they were stealing from the sacrifices and they were committing adultery in the tabernacle with women who came to worship. Those were pretty bad dudes. God saw to it that that was an end to that. He killed them both in battle and had the Ark of the Covenant taken. But was God able to get the Ark of the Covenant back? Yes, he did, after he caused a few problems for the Philistines. Was God able to raise up somebody and be prepared in advance to take Eli's place, even though Eli had bad sons? Yes, he was, because there was a woman named Hannah who prayed that God would give her a little boy, and he did, and she dedicated him to the Lord and brought him as a child. Shortly after he had been weaned, a little kid brought him and turned him over to Eli to serve in the tabernacle. And God called Samuel. So what the leaders of Israel are doing here at this point, they are rejecting God. Because God is able. He had shown it to them in their own lifetimes when he raised up Samuel. And none of them could criticize Samuel. Behold, thou art old, and thy sons walk not in thy ways. Now make us a king to judge us, like all the nations. We want to be like the Goyim. We, we don't want to be like the Jews anymore. We want to be like the Gentiles. <laughs> what a stupid thing to say. But the thing displeased Samuel when they said, Give us a king to judge us. And Samuel prayed unto the Lord. And the Lord said unto Samuel, It's okay, don't worry about it. Hearken unto the voice of the people in all that they say unto thee. Now here's the key. For they have not rejected thee. They have rejected me that I should not reign over them. You see, having a judge, having someone serving in the tabernacle was according to God's plan because God had set that system up. When they came out of Egypt, God didn't give them a king. He set up a different kind of a system. 
But they wanted a system like the world. Did you know that there are a lot of churches today who no longer want to function on the basis of New Testament church structure, but they want to function on the basis of business structure, corporation structure? We could talk a lot about that tonight. I know I'm a corporate lawyer for nonprofit corporations. Be careful. This is what Israel did. They didn't like the structure that God gave them. They wanted to be like the world around them. They have not rejected thee, for they have rejected, they have rejected me that I should not reign over them. God was the king. According to all the works which they have done since the day I brought them out of Egypt unto this day, wherewithal they have forsaken me and served other gods, so do they also unto thee. Hey, if they did it to me, do you not think they're going to do it to you? If they did it to Jesus, do they think you're going to do it to you? If they did it to all the apostles, do you not think they're going to do it to you? If you're functioning the way God wants you to function, you can expect the same kind of results. This is a principle that goes all the way back into the Old Testament. Now therefore, hearken unto their voice, howbeit yet protest solemnly unto them, and show them the manner of the king that shall reign over them. You know, tell them what it's going to be like. You know, they, they have this pie-in-the-sky kind of an idea. They have this warm, fuzzy glow about, man, the nations around us seem to be functioning really, really well. So... We ought to do that, too. Okay, tell them what it's going to be like. And Samuel told all the words of the Lord unto the people that asked of him a king. And he said, This will be the manner of the king that shall reign over you. He will take your sons and appoint them for himself, for his chariots, and to be his horsemen. Some shall run before his chariots, and he will appoint him captains over thousands and captains over fifties, and will set them, set them to ear his ground, that is, to reap his harvest, to reap his harvest, to make his instruments of war and instruments for his chariots. And he will take your daughters to be confectionaries and to be cooks and to be bakers. And he will take your fields and your vineyards and your olive yards. Ever heard of taxation? Even the best of them and give them to his servants. Hmm. Taking from one to give to somebody else. Do we have any kind of handout system like that here in the United States? And he will take the tenth of your seed and of your vineyards and give to his officers and to his servants. And he will take your men servants and your maid servants and your goodliest young men and your asses and put them to his work. He will take the tenth of your sheep and you shall be his servants. And you shall cry out in that day because your king, which you shall have chosen you, and the Lord will not hear you in that day. This is what's called the point of no return principle. We make choices as we go through life. But there comes a point sometime in each of our lives where there's a point of no return. We've seen that several times in the book of Acts where the people reject and they don't realize that in their rejection what is going to happen is that they're not going to get another chance. Esau understood that too late. He repented. He wanted to go back. He wanted the birthright. He wanted the blessing. He sought it carefully with tears, the book of Hebrews tells us, and he was rejected. You can go beyond the point of no return because of your desires for the things of the flesh, and there is no way back. You never know when that point of no return is going to come. You never know when it'll fall on you. And suddenly, you've gotten too close to the edge of the cliff and you're in free fall. You shall cry out in that day because of your king, which you shall have chosen you, and the Lord will not hear you in that day. Did Samuel warn them in advance? Yes. What does the next verse say? Verse 19. Nevertheless, the people refused to obey the voice of Samuel, and they said, Nay, but we will have a king over us, that we may also be like all the nations, that's all the goyim, all the Gentiles. 
and that our king may judge us and go out before us and fight our battles. Listen, kings don't fight battles alone. Do you understand that? Kings have control of your sons and your husbands, and kings send them into battle to die. And Samuel heard all the words of the people, and he rehearsed them in the ears of the Lord. Of course, the Lord had already heard them, too. And the Lord said to Samuel, Hearken unto their voice, and make them a king. And Samuel said unto the men of Israel, Go ye every man into his city. Now Samuel told them the consequences and what those consequences would be, but they wouldn't listen. You know that there were even worse consequences as the history of Israel progressed with many wicked kings and after the divided kingdom, lots more wicked kings. The north had only wicked kings and the south had mostly wicked kings until God removed the northern kingdom Israel with the hand of Assyria and the southern kingdom Judah by the hand of Babylon. When we reject God's word faithfully spoken by God's man, that is in fact rejecting God. The folks here in our text tonight don't understand that. But it is rejecting God even though God graciously granted them their request by giving them what was humanly best. Here in the case of Samuel, first of all, we'll see that. In chapter 10, this is two chapters later, Samuel calls the people together and he calls them unto the Lord to Mizpah. And he said unto the children of Israel, verse 18, Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, I brought you up Israel out of Egypt and delivered you out of the hand of the Egyptians and out of the hand of all kingdoms and of them that oppressed you. Now, we're studying that in the morning worship services as we study the book of Exodus. That's leading up to the Exodus and God delivering his people. Do you know how many times God goes back during the course of the history of Israel and through his prophets reminds them of Egypt, the world, bondage, and his deliverance. Hundreds of times. That's a key theme all the way through the Old Testament. Here Samuel is reminding them of that. Go back to your roots. Understand from what you've been delivered. God was their king. And ye have, verse 19, this day rejected your God, who himself saved you out of all your adversities and your tribulations, and ye have said unto him, he didn't say it to me, when you were talking to me, you were talking to him. Moses understood that principle. When the, when the tribes of Israel, in the middle of the wilderness, gathered themselves together against Moses and Aaron, and they wanted to stone him to death, he says, you haven't rebelled against me. You've rebelled against God. And God killed a bunch of them, you remember? Very dangerous when God has put his servant to proclaim his word faithfully, and the servant does it. When you reject what is said, and you can reject it not by just saying, I don't believe that, but by the way you do or don't respond. By the way, it does or doesn't change your life. You're not rejecting the servant. The servant is nothing. I am nothing. You're rejecting God. I'm merely a Western Union boy carrying a message and handing it to you. So what was going on in the book of Acts. You have rejected this day your God, who himself saved you out of all your adversities and tribulations, and you have said unto him, Nay, but set a king over us. Okay, so here we go. Now therefore present yourselves before the Lord by your tribes and by your thousands. When Samuel had caused all the tribes of Israel to come near, the tribe of Benjamin was taken. When he had caused the tribe of Benjamin to come near by their families, the family of Matri was taken. And Saul, the son of Kish, was taken. And when they sought him, he could not be found. You know, some of you, though you shouldn't have done it, have played the lottery. Some of you have bought those little scratch-off things that they sell at the, I guess, the Wawa down here. I never go into the Wawa, but I understand they sell those things. And, and different gas stations and places around here. 
You know, I think they were probably holding their breath thinking, wow, this is cool. This is like a lottery. We're rolling the dice. We're seeing who's going to get it. Because at the end, there's going to be somebody it comes up with. And the jackpot is hit. And the million dollar sign or $100 million or whatever it is, you see these signs by the highways you're driving in toward Philadelphia. And they open the box. And it's empty. <laughs> I think God was having a little bit of fun with them at that point. Because Saul couldn't be found. <laughs> so they decided, well, we better ask God where he is. Therefore they inquired of the Lord further, if the man should come yet thither. And the Lord answered, Behold, he hath hid himself among the stuff. <laughs> Go dig through the baggage and you'll find the guy. And they ran and fetched him thence. And when he stood among the people, he was higher than any of the people from his shoulders and upward. And Samuel said to all the people, See ye him whom the Lord hath chosen, that there is none like him among all the people. And all the people shouted and said, God save the king. Now God didn't give them some wimp. Saul wasn't pushing for the position. He was humble. He wanted to hide from it. He wanted somebody else to have it. But he was a big man. He was taller than anybody else in the entire nation. How'd you like to be the tallest guy in America? Big and muscular and handsome and young? Wow. I think there are probably some men who would like to have that kind of physical character qualities. I mean, when you see pictures of a younger Arnold Schwarzenegger or, you know, some of these power builders or some of the guys, I don't know all the names of the actors now, but I know there's some out there who run around without their t-shirts on flexing their muscles. Uh, you know, I suspect that there are a lot of girls who swoon over them and there are a lot of guys who wish, man, I wish I had that kind of a build. Saul was that kind of a man. He was a big man. He was a powerful man. We later find out that he's a relatively good leader. We find out that God is going to place his spirit upon him. We talked about that a little earlier this evening, about the spirit of God coming on people for empowerment. God said, you know, I'm going to give you the very best that's out there in terms of human things, and I'm even going to give him some people who will surround him, who will be faithful to him, who will be loyal to him. Look as you get down here a little verse. The, Samuel told the people the manner of the kingdom, and he wrote it in a book and laid it up before the Lord. In other words, this is the way it's got to work. He actually gave him instruction manual for how to run a nation. <laughs> you know, if I was Samuel, I'd say, let them wing it. Let them try to figure it out on their own. But Samuel wrote the manner of the kingdom in a book and laid it up before the Lord. And Samuel sent all the people away, every man to his house. But look at verse 26. Saul also went home to Gibeah, and there went with him a band of men whose hearts... God had touched. God gave him an instruction manual and God gave him a group of men. The hearts of whom God had touched to be his personal bodyguard, the men who supported him, the men who would be leaders under him, who would be willing to die for him, God gave him everything up front. In the book of Acts, we see God doing the same kind of thing. As Paul goes from city to city, from synagogue to synagogue, as he presents the word of God, we find some people responding. People whose hearts God touched. That's specifically said of Lydia, for example. He opened her heart. We see God opening the heart of the Philippian jailer and his family. We saw God opening the heart of the Ethiopian eunuch and God opening the heart of, of, of Samaritans and God opening the heart of different people as you move through the book of Acts. But we also find God hardening the hearts of some, like he did with Pharaoh. We don't like to see hard hearts, and so some of us back out of the jobs that God has given us to do. God often uses another principle when people are belly aching and want something else and want something different.
and want something better, there's a principle that relates to what we see going on here in 1 Samuel and what we see going on in Acts chapter 19. This is out of the Psalms. Psalm 106, verse 15. In its context of Psalm 106, God is speaking about the wilderness wanderings. How the people griped and complained and 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 griped and complained. Ten times, God get, finally got fed up with it. They reached the point of no return. Remember, we've talked about the point of no return principle. And here's what it says in verse 15. He gave them their request, but sent leanness into their soul. He gave them their request, but he sent leanness into their soul. God gave Israel its request. They got a king. He gave them the very best, humanly speaking, that was available. But he sent leanness into their soul as you look at the rest of the history of Israel. Be careful what you ask for, because God might just give it to you. God gives consequences in the lives of individuals as well as in nations when they reject his word. We've seen it here as they've chosen Saul. We see some consequences that are going to come about in the book of Acts and Acts chapter 19, where some believe and some don't. There are going to be some consequences. We'll see that in future weeks. But God also gives consequences in the lives of individuals as well as nations when they reject his word. 1 Samuel 15, five chapters later. Saul has just beat the Amalekites. He's killed everybody except King Agag. He also missed either Agag's wife or one of his sons at least, because we find, as I mentioned this morning, Haman is an Agagite. In the book of Esther, he's a descendant of Agag. He spared alive the sheep and the oxen that were the very best. He killed all the junk, but he spared the good ones. God had said, kill everything. 1 Samuel 15, verse 16. Then Samuel said unto Saul, Stay, and I will tell thee what the Lord hath said to me this night. And he said unto him, Say on. And Samuel said, When thou wast little in thine own sight, wast thou not made the head of the tribes of Israel, and the Lord anointed thee king over Israel? That's what we've just read about. He was little in his own sight. He was a big man, but he had hidden among the baggage. But God said, I'm going to put you as king over Israel. And the Lord sent thee on a journey and said, Go and utterly destroy the sinners, the Amalekites, and fight against them until they be consumed. Wherefore then didst thou not obey the voice of the Lord, but didst fly upon the spoil, and didst evil in the sight of the Lord? Now Saul didn't understand the principle which David understood. When David got put on the spot about his sin of adultery with Bathsheba, and Nathan the prophet came in and told him the story about the man who had the little lamb that was a pet, and this rich guy next door came over and took the lamb and killed it and you know cooked it for dinner for his traveling guest. And David got furious and said, the man's going to die and he's going to pay back fourfold. And Nathan turned to him and said, thou art the man. The first words out of David's mouth were, I have sinned. Now when Samuel puts Saul on the grill, that's not how Saul responds. The first thing Saul does is he gives an excuse. How often when we have come to a point in our lives where our sin has been pointed out, have we begun to make excuses? Perhaps it was pointed out by our conscience and we began to argue with our conscience. Or perhaps it was pointed out by a spouse. We began to argue with our spouse or pointed out by a good friend and we began to argue with our good friend instead of saying, you know, you're right. The Bible teaches that and I disobeyed. David said, I have sinned. Look what Saul did. Yea, I have obeyed the voice of the Lord and have gone the way of, that the Lord sent me and have brought Agag the king of Amalek and have utterly destroyed the Amalekites. 
But the people took of the spoil. He's passing the buck. <laughs> I can hardly wait till we get to next week in the morning worship service. Pharaoh uses the same tactics that Saul uses here. Don't want to preach that message yet, but I mean, you look at the parallels and it boggles the mind. The people took of the spoil, the sheep and the oxen, the chief of the things which should have been utterly destroyed, to sacrifice unto the Lord thy God in Gilgal. Oh, let's get spiritual about it. And Samuel said, Hath the Lord his great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices, as in obeying the voice of the Lord. We just finished talking about that, didn't we? Mighty in the scriptures means that you hear and obey. There is so much parallel between what's going on here with, with Saul and what's going on over in Acts chapter, end of Act 18 and first part of chapter 19. It's incredible. You see people responding in precisely the same ways in both places. Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice, and to hearken than the fat of rams. For rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft, and stubbornness is as iniquity and idolatry. Because thou hast rejected the word of the Lord, he hath also rejected thee from being king. Rejecting the word of the Lord has consequences. That's what we see in Acts chapter 19, where we are tonight. When you reject the word of the Lord, it has consequences. When you harden your heart against the Lord, it has consequences. When the servant of God preaches the word to you faithfully and you do not listen, it has consequences. Because thou hast rejected the word of the Lord, he hath also rejected thee from being king. Sammy says, oh, no, 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 don't, don't say that, don't say that. Please, 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 please come and sacrifice with me. Let, let's, let's make things up. Let's do it right. Let's, let's do the right thing the right way. Verse 28, Samuel said unto him, The Lord hath rent the kingdom of Israel from thee this day, and hath given it to thy neighbor of thine that is better than thou. Saul had gone into free fall. He disobeyed one too many times. He'd experienced the principle of the point of no return, just like Esau. His descendants would never again sit on the throne. What have you and I lost? I look back over my life and I'm sure there are things that I have lost. Having reached some point of no return because I didn't obey. I knew what was right but didn't do it. Things lost. Things lost for eternity because heavenly rewards last for eternity. The stuff you get here doesn't last for eternity. Understand? You can accumulate and amass all you want in this world but it will burn up. We're not owners, we're stewards. What is that in your hand? Time, talent, energy, resources, money, lands, goods, collectibles, stuff. You're not an owner, you're a steward. There are so many interrelated principles here when we begin to compare Old Testament with New Testament. And that's what we're supposed to do. These things were written for our edification upon whom the ends of the world are come. These things are written for exhorting us so that we might know how to live, not just what to believe. Now, I want to show you something about the grace of God in this context and in the context of the book of Acts. We see points of no return. We see chastening hand of God. We see removal of the Holy Spirit. All those things are being discussed in our text in the, in the book of Acts. Now, let me show you the grace of God. Saul was from the tribe of Benjamin. 
He was the very biggest man in all of Israel. He was young, strong, handsome. But did you know, and I'm sure you did, that there was another man from the tribe of Benjamin named Saul also. Except he was small and ugly. The Bible says so. In fact, he had his name changed from Saul to another name that means little guy. Acts 13.9, we've already gone through this passage. Six chapters ago. Then Saul, who also is called Paul. Paulos means little one. <laughs> little guy. What a different Saul from the Saul who was king of Israel. Filled with the Holy Ghost. The Holy Ghost had come on Saul in the Old Testament, but had left. And that's why David, fearful of the same thing happening to him, says, Lord, take not thy Holy Spirit from me. Filled with the Holy Ghost, set his eyes on him. And here he does battle with the devil instead of like Saul trying to get the devil's goods. Here in chapter 13 is where Saul gets his name changed to Paul. It's of interest to note that the only time the name Saul is used of Paul after this point in the book of Acts is when Paul goes back and refers historically to when he met Christ on the road to Damascus and the name Saul is never used of Paul anywhere else in the New Testament. He was changed. He was totally, utterly transformed. Now remember, we looked at Jacob when we were going through the book of Genesis. And Jacob had his name changed to Israel. But we see some flip-flops with him, where sometimes after that he's referred to as Jacob, and sometimes after that he's referred to as Israel. One name means supplanter, another name means prince with God. And he flip-flops. And he growls in carnality. But God used him. But we never see that with Paul. His name is changed. And it's only in two historical instances in the book of Acts where Paul is preaching and he says, I used to be Saul and this is what happened to me. Jesus said, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? He didn't rewrite what Jesus said and say, Paul, Paul, why persecutest thou me? Quoting Christ, he quotes him accurately. But never again does God refer to him as Saul. A changed man. It's also of interest that in Acts 13, that is the only place where Old Testament King Saul is mentioned by Paul. Quite a contrast. Both in the same chapter, Acts verse 9 is where he gets his name changed to Paul. We get down to verse 14, just a few verses after that, and we find that he sails to Antioch of Pisidia, on the, in the Sabbath day, he sits down in the synagogue and he begins to preach. And he reminds them of what we've just read in 1 Samuel. Verse 20, after that he gave them judges about the space of 450 years until Samuel the prophet. And afterward they desired a king and God gave unto them Saul, the son of Kis, a man of the tribe of Benjamin, by the space of 40 years. And when he had removed him, he raised up unto them David to be their king, to whom also he gave testimony and said, I have found David, the son of Jesse, a man after mine own heart, which shall fulfill all my will. What an indictment against Saul. The people wanted a king. God said, I'll give you the best that's out there right now. Humanly speaking, they were excited. They all cheered. They clapped. They shouted. Stomped their feet, jumped up and down. You know, head of Izzy's party. But David was a man after God's own heart who would fulfill all his will. Of this man's seed, God hath, according to his promise, raised up unto Israel a Savior, Jesus. You know, people were not impressed by Paul. He was ugly and contemptible. He says so. 2 Corinthians 10, verse 10. For his letters, say they, are weighty and powerful, but his bodily presence is weak and his speech contemptible. Chapter 11, verse 29. 
Who is weak and I am not weak? Who is offended and I burn not? Paul says, you want to talk about weak guys? Hey, you can talk about your tough guys. Want to talk about weak guys? Give me anybody. Let them come on. I'm weaker than they are. He was a shrimp. Chapter 12, next chapter. Wherefore, I take pleasure in infirmities, in reproaches, in necessities, in persecutions, in distresses, for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then am I strong. Paul knew I can't do it alone. He understood it. God had chosen a man who simply couldn't do it. And that's why Christ got the glory. You know, I think that should give hope to all of us for being useful in the service of Christ. It's a point the New Testament makes quite frequently. Let me give you just a couple of illustrations. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 27. But God hath chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. God hath chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things which are mighty. Do you think Paul could identify with that? I think so. The Corinthians were all into the big, tough, cool stuff. Paul reminds them that's not the way God works. Because then people get the glory and God doesn't get the glory. 2 Corinthians 12.9 Paul is about to throw in the towel. He's tired. He's worn out. He's been beat up more times than he can count. Although he does count them for us in chapter 11. But when he cried out to the Lord, God said unto him, My grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Yes, every ministry will have some success and will have some and many times great resistance, great opposition. It's what we see happening here in our text tonight. Acts 19, verses 8 through 10. We find some people believing. They stick with Paul for 90 days, three months. Paul preaches his heart out to them. And some of them really believe. And some of them, it says, their hearts were hardened. You know, the Word of God always has one of two effects. Either it brings us under conviction of sin and we repent, or it brings us under conviction of sin, we get uncomfortable with that, we don't like it, and we reject it. That is, we harden our hearts. You've heard the Word of God from this pulpit for 75 years. You've heard many missionaries, different pastors. Some you probably liked, some you probably didn't. The issue was, did they preach the Word of God? If you rejected the Word of God, you weren't rejecting the man. You weren't even merely rejecting the message. God says you rejected him. And if you do it often enough, there comes a point of no return. That's what happened in our text in Acts tonight. Paul stayed in town, didn't move too far away, went to a place where there would be people who were willing to hear, to be trained, and to be sent out to serve Christ. Some good lessons for us to learn doesn't matter whether you're small, doesn't matter whether you're weak, doesn't matter whether you're old. I remember that's the first thing they said to him, the elders said to him, you're old. So? Your sons are no good. So? Do you not think God can put someone in as he did with Samuel himself when Eli's sons were wicked? Our gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you once again for your powerful word, the practical things that are in it, things we see repeated over and over again from Old Testament to New Testament, things that by your grace 
in your mercy. You gave the very best to Israel, but because it really wasn't your choice in terms of the system to be used, even the human best failed. And so you chose a man after your own heart, a man who would do all your will. We pray, Father, that you will make us men and women of God who are after your own heart, that you will make us people who will do, not merely know, but who will do your will. For we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Our closing hymn tonight is number 692. It will take me a second to program the machine, but we're going to sing all four verses of hymn number